I'm out. Okay, good morning, folks. Uh, this is Jim Hodson with the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, and uh, you can see in front of us we've got we got Kevin with us today, and uh, and we're going to be doing an, an update here on the uh, on the YF-16. So we're going to interview Kevin from inside the. Uh, inside the intake. What's going on, Kevin? Well, what we're doing is putting back together what we took apart over the last few months. We had a major success last Saturday. We finally got the forward fuselage back in line and hooked up with the mid fuselage. That took about three weeks of wiggling and cursing and busted knuckles. Uh, what you see right here, this strip you see where the sheet metal is removed, turned out to be the secret. It's called the belly band. And it's really the last thing installed in the factory when you put the airplane together in the first place. We had resisted taking it apart. We finally decided it was the only way to do it. We drilled out several hundred uh, what they call huck fasteners. And the thing about a huck fastener is it's a uh, industrial strength aircraft grade pop rivet with a steel stem. And we <laughs> we scrapped about 20 or 30 nice drill bits doing that work this last couple of weeks. But that let us have the freedom of motion to get the two pieces together. Because you can see from where I'm at, the duct slopes downhill, yep. while the other parts of the airplane want to line up straight. So that, that's where we needed to have the freedom of motion here. We took this strip out, and we'll be putting it back in. You see these temporary fasteners, they're called Clecos, that we're using to hold the skin in place until we get the, the uh, huck fasteners back in. I'm also having to deal with some fasteners coming through from the outside that I could reach from in here is what I was doing when the, the show started here. Okay. So I'm going to meet you around the back side of the airplane and we'll show you some other things. Okay, I'm going to... So play. you like really know what you're doing, huh? Well, we're, we, we fake it well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is going to be a little awkward. We're going to move around here while uh, while Kevin is moving. So, uh, uh, so Don, we'll come back to that don't, one. Uh, don't go away. You're just going to get some weird video and audio. We got a C-clamp on there. I'll get this. You got it? Yeah, two-hander. Okay, we're free. We're free, we're free. Okay, we're going to move around back and let uh, Kevin continue here. Hey, there we go. Here. So these are the skin panels that are going to go back in there. This is the belly band. Uh, it's interesting, there's graffiti on here from the Air Force lab guys that took it apart and uh, whatever they work on it. So we've got these two panels that will go on either side of where I was laying in the inlet duct in there. Uh, one of the really neat parts about this is that we're getting things cleaned up. And now that things are fit back together. Hey, Dave? Yeah. Can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Looking, it's looking pretty good that way already. So our, our homemade tooling, we had enough adjustments, we were able to wiggle the airplane together. We had guys like, like Don Charlie and Smitty that have done this before in the field. Uh, it really helped us from experience. There's only been about six or seven of, seven of us working on this every Saturday, and it's really worked out well. Uh, everybody knew what they were doing. We, we worked together, we got all the big pieces back lined up together. Uh, and it really felt gratifying to put it back together. We took it apart, and like, as Jim has pointed out in the past, nobody's really done this in the field with homemade tooling Never. before. Never. And there were a couple sleepless nights about, <laughs> are we going to get this back together? And we had a lot of places where it's a precision fit. We had some seat metal that was only 30 thousandths on the line, but it still it wasn't fitting. And there was one place for Smitty last week just hit it with his hand and it sprung and everything snapped together that last half inch. Well, we had a question about uh, if he's in the, the ammo bay, uh, the ammo bay area up there. Yes, the center of this where, uh, where Jim Duarte is sitting in there, he's going to get screws to hold the, the shear web on the side of, of the ammo bay. That is where that ammo drum that we showed you a few weeks ago right. was inside there. That would fit in there. Gun breach was. Now, that's not the original shear panel. That's, that's the one that's a, a 
stronger piece. There was a hole through that where the ammo chutes came from the ammo bay into the gun bay to join the gun breach. So what was the hardest part of this process? Yeah, just getting it lined up and slid. We have a bunch of little screws at the bottom of the... Yeah, show, let's, sh there. let's show everybody that, how you could make the adjustments. So, these screws here, let us slide it left and right. There's screws oh, really? underneath in three places, so we could tilt it here. We could raise it. What we had to do to get that worked in, Smitty had done this before with factory cooling. Okay. So that's our strong point to carry the weight, and we can pivot it around that point and take everything straight up and down either way from there. So, what do you, th I mean, this has been a, a very successful project here. Oh. And, and from the very beginning, it was like, I don't know, can we really do this? I mean, I was, I had confidence in the people who had been involved, but what do you think was the hardest part about this? Uh, or what out, made the... Drilling out tons of rusted screws. Okay. Uh, carbide grinders taking out the, uh, the screw heads wow. uh, and then once we got it open we could take off the nut plates we're going to replace the nut plates so we can put the panel back on properly uh, and then figuring out making sure we had all the pieces here to put it back together right and which skin overlapped which skin because they had put that 10 inch gap in it we ripped out all their their bogus sheet metal work uh, and then make sure we had this set up with enough adjustment to get us lined up and put back together well, it's, it's marvelous. Now, we, we've still got some challenges ahead of us, but do you, do you think the challenges ahead are going to be as much as this challenge was? They're going to be different. Uh, this was the biggest thing. Okay. Having this airplane come apart and getting it back together. Here's some Smitty's got his model. Oh, let's see what you got here, Smitty. Yeah. Okay. So the early model, Smitty worked up on this one of how that thing would go up and down and left and right. Okay. We just did this on a styrofoam in the garage and we then turned it into steel work. Okay. And that was about a month or so ago and we did that. Longer than that. So Longer than that. This was the model. This was the, how are we going to do this? this first and from the model then you built the superstructure. Right. We wow. kind of custom built the superstructure wow. in place. We measured everything where it was sitting relative to the concrete. We built this roller frame and put it in there. That's how you showed the bolts on the bottom for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. talked about bolts yeah. on the bottom. So we welded nuts on there. We ran bolts in. To jack this thing up and down. So we can rent this out now. <laughs> the other great news is this week we got a surplus F-16 landing gear yes. from a decommissioned airplane up at Shepard Air Force Base. It's actually a, a C model, it's an early C model before they bolt the landing gear doors. One of the things we checked today was the fittings still fit the YF. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's so terrific. Okay. And attach the landing gear, get it back on its own feet. It'll be the first time it's on its feet in, in 40 years. 40 years, yeah. 40 years it's been, it's been on its own, yep. own legs. It's amazing, huh? When, when, uh, when you guys started, you built a little design here. Did you guys have to reference a lot of tech manuals, or was this pure uh, experience no. and knowledge to know to pull this thing apart? No, it, it was more field engineering and, and experience. And line lock smitty that had done this. <laughs> Uh, the next trip is after we get it on its gear, it's going to be getting the wings back on it. 
And that's a fairly precise fit. You yeah. know, bolts in every kit in the tooling to hold the wing at the right location. While we slip the bolts in. So we've got more things to do. This is not going to be done next week. You know, this, this is a, that no, but you all feel that this was the biggest challenge in front of you. This was huge. This has never been done. No. Getting that, getting that stretch out of there, getting rid of the bogus sheet metal work, and putting it back together in a way that um, it, it's going to be solid. It, it's going back. It's only got a whole 1G now instead of 9G. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but it, it's still got to support itself. We wanted to make sure we treated all the corrosion we found. Spraying lots of lots of primer on parts. You'll see green primer everywhere uh, to keep it from corroding. It's going to live outdoors here for a while. Right. So we get a better building. Um, I, I had. I had one comment from from Sig, the guy, one of the guys at uh, at the, the Air Force Research Lab. Yeah. He was with this airplane for its entire career there, so he spent his entire career with this airplane. And one of the things that he mentioned was that, and he wanted everybody to be aware of. Is that every F-16 flying today is do, is flying in the configuration it's in because of this airplane? Yeah, so this airplane was used to test all the antennas on the airplane, uh, even to the late models. You can see right here, where there's this colored paint. That was the control fuel tanks that were tested around here to see how they affected the antenna pattern. Oh, does it? Okay. It's different than the original manufacturer date, and the whole pattern was different. And we found where it actually had blown out some of the screw holes in the bulkhead that was attached to it. So they moved the screw holes when they made the replacement parts after the old hook. Well, and you've got the ground off part of the lip yeah, on the. Yeah, uh, this was the very last flight when the nose landing gear broke on uh, Phil Ostriker. He, he, he knew it was broken, they had an unsafe gear light, held the nose up as long as he could with arrow braking, and at about 60 miles an hour, it just fell through. And, well, we got a bunch of people on here, so let's ask: Does anybody have any questions of Kevin right now, or anybody else? We've got uh, Bill Morris. Bill Morris is here with us, and Rick Ghostriker's with us, and Smitty's here. So, if if any of you've got questions about what they've been doing here or what they're planning to do, uh, please go ahead and ask. We know it's kind of windy, so I hope the sound is still coming through okay. But we've had uh, we've had uh, a bunch of people on here watching this morning. So, uh, so next steps here right now, the most immediate things is what just uh, is just closing up the gap. Well, what we're doing is buttoning up all the structural fasteners. There's laundry on the bottom, there's laundry on the top. Brand new training bolts up there at the top. That's holding that center and mid fuselage together. There's another set at the bottom that's still be put in. Uh, what we're going to do is once we get all the fasteners in. Well, I've, well, I've still got it on here. I got a question from my, Mike James. He says, "Was this?" That's uh, that's our musical accompaniment. Uh, was there still a lot of a uh, lot of waveguides routed into the inlet for the antenna, or had that been ripped out? It had all been ripped out. All the wiring and all the plumbing, including the test stuff, is gone. We've got holes in the inlet where they ran their wiring. Well, you saw me in, inside the inlet at the beginning of this. Uh, if you go back and look at that again, you'll see some holes around my head there that we're going to be patching to make the inlet. Uh, not so much because we care about the airflow to the engine. Not anymore. We, we don't want to have places for birds to nest. Got it. Okay, and we got another question here. Well, when does the landing gear go on? Uh, after we get the fuselage all buttoned up, and then what we're going to do is we're going to lower the tooling and make sure it does hold its own weight. The landing gear will probably be the next step after we get the, the fuselage structurally together. Because we want this thing to stand on its gear. It's easier to work around. When it's not in this cradle, you know, we're dripping over ourselves with crawling under here. So that's hopefully in the next month or so here, we'll get the gear under Okay. Here. Got a comment here from John Calvin. Now, John is working on the OV-10s out in California, so he's doing a lot of restoration work himself. But he says, uh, awesome job. Love hearing the history of this airframe. Thank you. How long, uh, from an operational standpoint, how long did this YF-16 
could fly? Was it a what, could it fly for a whole hour? Was it a 45 minute flight? No, no it, 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 it was about hours. an hour and a half hour. Okay, got, a, got another question. Uh, how are you able to figure figure our C model gear would fit the YF? Uh, interesting. I, I used to literally sit next to guy Travis Putman that designed this landing gear, and I called him when we started this project. I said, Did you make any huge changes? He said, No. Uh, you know, some of the metal got thicker, but the, the geometry and the way it folds is identical, and the bulkhead spacing for the wing attaches, which also drives the landing gear attach. It's the same in this airplane. I can quote those numbers from memory. Um, we just did a check this morning. Since we just got these parts this week, I just slipped one in the hole full of grease, and it's like, it's perfect. Wow. Like a landing gear. Like, like no gear. kidding. You put, oh, God. Yeah, just, yeah. Oh, that's landing cool. Gear. One of the end pins that mounts the landing gear to the airframe. Because it's a tapered pin, and I was worried they might have changed it. Um, it it's, actually, what they did was, going from the, the YF to the production, they wanted to make as few changes as possible. They had a good design here. They didn't want to screw it up. They did put a 10-inch stretch in it because it needed a little more gas. And it gained 900 pounds of gas. Whoa, that's a lot. Well, um, but uh, other things like the landing gear geometry, they just beefed up some of the material. Now, over time, the, the wheels got bigger. Uh, late C models, block 40 and on, got the, uh, the bulge landing gear doors because the tire just so much bigger. This airplane only weighed 23,000 pounds max, which is why it can fly for a long time on the what is it? Oh my uh, god. The block 60, F16 weighs, can weigh up to 52,000 pounds with the conformals and 600 gallon tanks. See, the Eagle, what I flew, was about a 50,000 pound jet. And so you're looking at something half the weight of yep. my jet, yeah. Wow. I got I got another thing for you. And any one of you, Bill or Rick or anybody here can answer this, but we've done this is like number 29 airplane here. So it's not like the, it's not like this is our first airframe. We've done a lot of different restorations, but we haven't had access to the resources you guys have. So give it to, to say a little bit about having access to people who actually did the work on the airplane oh, at the, the factory prices. and those kinds of yeah, things. Knowing why things go together in certain orders. Uh, just doing this whole, somebody off the street tried to do this, it, it would have been a mess. Uh, it's basic aircrafting skills in terms of how you put in rivets and how we get things lined up, but knowing which piece has to overlap which way. Uh, having Smitty, who has done, literally been there and done this, was, was just priceless. Now, I really can't say enough about having the smart guys who have done all this work before. Well, there's the, the, Smitty. There's the right. smart guys. You were, you were smart. You knew how to put it back together. You're smart. We're giving you credit for that. <laughs> Okay, so we've got, there's Smitty we've been talking about, and Rick O'Striker in the middle, and there's, uh, and there's Bill. And he's modeling his new bump cap. Uh, he, he put a dent in his head, <laughs> and that's actually a hard hat inside a baseball cap. Keep him from banging his head on this airplane. So this airplane has drawn blood. Drawn blood, I love it. The vampire. Okay, here's one, one, more, one more question, and Bill may want to get in on this one. But again, from John Calvin, uh, with all the work restoring this airframe, is it planned to be a yard bird, pole, or protected in a hangar? Yeah, never on a pole. Yeah. Amen. It'll be a yard bird until we can build a building. There we go. Uh, the nature of this airplane and how iconic it is to Fort Worth, the community, the, the world military forces, and our own Air Force are just, uh, it begs for this airplane to be indoors. And this, uh, yeah, it's got to be. Going to be a driving factor in getting us a, a museum building to put this one in. Now, this airplane put a lot of people's kids through college you know, over the last 45 years. <laughs> His dad was a test engineer on the program. So he had it from the time it was built to the time it was retired. Wow. Wow. So, you know, the whole city of Fort Worth kind of grew up with this airplane, and it's just, we wanted to make it right. That's what we've been trying to do. 
Well, somebody was telling me the other day, and I, I can't remember who I was talking to about this, but with the, with the numbers of these airplanes that have now been built, there have now been, or close to it, more F-16s built than F-4s. Uh, it's close. It's not quite there yet. There were a little over 5,000 F-4s and Phantoms built. Uh, yeah, 5,000 yeah, yeah. yeah. 5,004, I think. And we're at 4,870 right now. Wow. Uh, so it, and there's 100 orders that Greenville's got to fill to deliver international airplanes. So F-16 is still in production. It just moved to Greenville, South Carolina. And do we have any idea why they had to move it there? Well, the, the production line went cold. We had a stretch where there were no orders, and we needed the factory for more space in the main plant for F-35. Okay. So it was more efficient to take the F-16 tooling down, and we weren't sure there were going to be any more orders. And then after two years of not producing them, uh, several of the UAE and some other people came in and said, we want more F-16s. Uh, several Euro uh, European Macaulay's wanted some more. Uh, so they said, we need to reestablish the line. They've been doing uh, maintenance, repair, and overhaul work in South Carolina, in Greenville. And they had floor space and they needed work. So we said, okay, this tooling has been moved around the world before. It's been in Belgium, it's been in the Netherlands. You know, it's going to South Carolina. So they're building new Block 70s. Uh, which is the standard now the call the B configuration. And uh, that's what they're, they're building in South Carolina for exports here. Okay, well, we're about out of time for today. Anything, uh, any more, last questions here? And from anybody here at all, any last comments you'd like to make or, uh, or tell people about? No, just comments from the Peanut Gallery. Anybody got anything to add to our today's talk? Same thing, Peanut Gallery. Doing good, bro. <laughs> Good design, fine work. <laughs> uh, couldn't hear great, but it sounded like uh, our YOV-10A is getting a roommate. Uh, yeah, if uh, the YOV-10 out in the, out in the back, our mock-up, uh, it does have a roommate. It may be the F-16. Right now, its roommate is the TA-4, which is ready to paint, but uh, we don't want it to sit out for the winter. But. Yeah, the, 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 this YF may end up being in there next to the OV-10 mock-up, so it's interesting. So for now, uh, everybody uh, stay safe. Uh, keep your distance from everybody. We appreciate you being with us here today, and uh, we'll have something else for you on, uh, on Wednesday and then again next Saturday. But for now, from the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home of the most touchable warbirds in Texas, it's Gary Goff, Jim Hodson, Kevin, Dave, and all the other folks here. Thanks. Bye.